We come to the second week of our February sermon series on studying the Bible. And just a reminder, it's a four-part sermon series, although we have five weeks. Uh, in the middle of that, we're going to have a special uh, week where we take a break from the sermon series. We're going to invite one of our campus ministers to come out and give a message and talk about his ministry and what he's doing down south of us. But other than that, the four, four weeks this month of our sermon series, we're going to be talking about how to study the Bible. And we started last week by introducing the idea of Scripture and the idea that Scripture is authority. It's something that is a person of faith we can build our life on. And we talked about how we use it and why we use it, why it's authoritative, and what that means to the church. And this week we're moving on, we're talking about observation. And it's a very simple process, if you remember last week. It's a four-part process, which we call SOAP, because pastors like acronyms. Uh, scripture, observation, application, and prayer. And so this week we're going to talk about observation and what that means. And we had an extremely long scripture reading that started off. In fact, it was the length of a whole chapter in one of Paul's letters. And it's uh, actually important, I think. Usually when you talk about scripture, uh, the pastor will jump to uh, chapter 3, 16, and 17 there. And that's the ending of the reading, the part uh, everyone probably recognized a little bit. Every scripture is inspired by God, Paul says there in verse 16. And is useful for teaching, for showing mistakes, for correcting, and for training character, so that the person who belongs to God can be equipped to do everything that is good. Everyone's heard of that. But usually what happens is the pastor jumps right to that as the scripture reading because the context for that scripture is so long. It is so long. In fact, the way Paul writes this, and this is an extended argument to Timothy, highlighting the teachings of two people in the early church that he lifted up. He lifts these two folks up, if you remember at the end of chapter 2, as uh, teaching false doctrine or wrong doctrine. They're talking about how the resurrection or the work of the resurrection is already complete, has already happened, and that the work of Jesus Christ is completed, so we don't need to worry about doing anything. This was fairly a okay got from the tone that Paul writes, this is fairly offensive to him. Because Paul at this point has given up lots of things in life for the gospel. He's given up lots of things. And then to have two of the folks that lead in, in some of his churches to stand up and completely distort the gospel, this offends him on a very deep level. And so he writes to Timothy, and, and part of his instruction to Timothy on how to act, think, and to speak as a leader in the church is wrapped up in this argument spanning chapter 2 and chapter 3 of this letter. And he gets caught up in talking about the argument. And I want to highlight something, because we could spend all day talking about heresy and this heresy and other heresies. But I want to highlight something specific that is really in line with our sermon series for month, and that is the fact that these two people that came to this different conclusion. They're reading the same scripture. They're understanding the same story. They're hearing the same gospel that Paul and Timothy heard and preached. They're reading the text that Paul and Timothy read. They're in the community of faith, so to speak, at other churches that Paul and Timothy have been in. And yet they begin teaching something different. And this comes down to one of the fundamental realities of us as humans. And that's when we approach the text, when we approach the Bible, the Word of God, we tend to read our own thoughts, views, and beliefs into it. This is our standard mode of operation. This is what we do. We are no better than the kids that were just up here, and they hear that bit about following mom and dad and listening to them, and boy, that's hard. Boy, that's hard. So it's easier for us not to hear that thing, or to at least not value it as much. And that's what these two folks that Paul talks about today have done. They have devalued parts of the scripture and parts of the gospel story to the point that it's created something completely different than the faith that Paul 
and it highlights the chief task we all have when we want to be serious about hearing God's word. When we seriously want to crack open the Bible and study it. And that's how we observe, how we read, how we approach the very Word of God. One of the hardest things you do when you're a first-year seminary student is the professors have to train you to understand that when you work with God's Word continuously, it's not like being in Sunday school every single day. <laughs> oh Lord, it was only that simple. It's actually a lot more difficult because we as people have to learn to lay down our values and our preconceived notions and simply hear the Word of God. Simply hear the Word of God. I remember my very first day of seminary, I signed up for a course that was called Inductive Bible Study of the Gospel of Matthew. And inductive Bible study is a methodology for studying the Bible. It's a prerequisite to get into upper-level exegesis classes. So it was a low-level, five or six hundred-level class for all you academic folks out there. And as we studied, we got there, and I, and I did two terrible things you should never do if you ever plan on going to college or ever want to go back. One, the class I took was taught by Dr. Bauer. Dr. Bauer is the dean of biblical interpretation for my seminary. He's the dean of the school that that class falls under. Don't ever take a class from the dean. You're just setting yourself up for a hard time. Second, as is my homework move when I was in college, I showed up about 10 minutes late. So the very first day, trying to find the classroom, trying to find the lecture hall, and I walk in, and the only seats that are left are the ones in the very front row. Oh, Lord. Luckily, though, by God's grace, I, I slide in and take one of those front seats and put my laptop up and try to hide behind it. And the professor's calling the roll and the teacher's assistant's marking off who's there, who's there. And they hadn't got to me yet, so I was very, very, very thankful. And this is a cl normal-sized classroom. It used to only have about 30 people in it. And they've crammed, you know, 40 to 50 people in this room because it was an introductory class. And Every single person had to have. And so there are people that were leaning up against the blackboard in the back of the room, waiting for the promise that next time there'll be more chairs and more desks. And as we are calling a roll, we get through the roll, and Dr. Bauer steps up and he starts to lecture, and he talks first about this idea of observation of the text, this idea that how we approach the text will inform us as much as the text will if we're not careful. That we'll see ourselves in God's word instead of seeing God's word if we all make if we do not make intentional thought, intentional decisions to put those thoughts out of our head, to put our own desires and selfish ambitions out of our head, and come to the text empty. And he, to illustrate, stood up and he wrote one. Scripture reference from the book of Genesis at the front, very start of Genesis, chapter 1, and he goes on to chapter 2, and then stopped and drew a hard line and drew another reference from Genesis starting midway through chapter 2 and chapter 3 to 4. And he started writing, and he wasn't even planning on getting this into it so early, but he starts writing and he's teaching us to diagram different sections of Scripture based on uh, their ideas within them. And as he's writing out this diagram, he begins to label them as two different creation stories. And there's a gentleman in the back, and I went to Asher, which is a non-denominational seminary, although in the Wesleyan tradition. And he was of a different denomination. And Dr. Bauer labor, labels both of these readings as first creation story, second creation story. This gentleman, in his wise age of 22, stops the professor and says, Doctor, there's only one creation story. What are you doing? And the chalk stops on the board. And he turns around and he says, well, no, there are two. And this brand new student sitting in the back of the room proceeds to get into an argument with the professor about it. Because he had been taught, he said, since Sunday school that there is only one creation story. In fact, if you look in the first five chapters of Genesis, there are in fact two count recountings of the creation 
The first is what we would consider the, uh, the one that they would share around the campfire, what we call the oral creation story. And this is the oldest creation story. This is the creation story that was around before the temple was around, before there were priests, before God parted the Red Sea. And then you have, later on in the next part of Genesis, the second creation story, which is just the priest's new account. So what the priest did when the temple was formed is they took all these oral traditions and they wrote them down. They, what we'd say, codified them and made them into a cohesive story. And then, as we learn from today's scripture, with all scripture being inspired by God, and God breathed would be a, a more accurate translation of that, through God's leading, they created what we have in Genesis. But for this young seminary student that sat ten rows behind me, it wasn't enough for him. And finally, as he's at this point standing and all but yelling at his professor, slams his laptop shut, throws in his bag, and walks out of the room. Slyly, one of the guys laying up, sitting against the backboard, slided into a seat, just thankful to have a free desk. What the problem with that gentleman was, he was reading his own views and values into the text. He never stopped to really listen to God's word. It was his word, or the word of his Sunday school teacher, or the word that someone had planted in him at some point. It wasn't what was written on the page. And that's our chief problem when we approach the text. And it's not new. We like to think of it, oh, this is a new age problem because the world's so politicized and so split, it's something new. No, this has been going on ever since the church was created. Paul's referencing this problem, and it hasn't even been 50 years since Christ was crucified. From the beginning, we've struggled with how to read the word of God, how to let God's word inform our lives. It started here. Within 50 years after this text, there was the first major heresy, a wrong teaching in the church. Then, further down the road, it got worse as the church split and fought over how to interpret the text. Every major split in the church has come from that simple question. How do we observe God's word? How do we look at it, read it, and digest it? And so I offer you, simply this morning, one thing, one story out of the Gospels. Because a man came to Jesus, and it has a lot of the same issues we have here. A man came to Jesus, and he asked him, you know, I've followed every rule in the Bible. I've done everything. I've lived the way you wanted. I've gone to temple when I should have offered the offerings. The Levites told me to offer. I've lived my life the way it said I should live. What do I do to inherit eternal life? And this story is often trotted out during stewardship to try to get people to, to increase their givings. They say, well... Jesus instructed this man to do this, so we should all do it. But Jesus turns to him and he says, Go, take everything you have. Sell it to the poor. And then you'll have eternal life. I want you to think about this. This comes from the, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all recount this story. This doesn't have anything to do with money. I want us to hear that. On face value, it is a story about money Jesus talks to us about. But it has nothing to really do with money. Because what Jesus instructs him to do is to empty his heart. Take the things that fill your heart. Empty them out. Offer them on the altar. That you might hear God's message to for so that man, it happened to be his wealth. Take everything you have and get rid of it, sell it to the poor, and then you'll be able to hear the message of eternal life. For lots of people, it is something else. It's something other. There's something that's so entangled our hearts, that's captivated us, that holds us as a snare, that we can't approach the text without reading it into the words of God himself. 
can't approach the text without seeing it through that lens that we wear. I want to invite you all to take the glasses the kids gave you. A little object lesson. I want you to take that Bible in front of you, or the people. And if you happen to be like Sharon, you got the pirate glasses. Congratulations. I want you to read the text. I want you to see the text in front of you with these glasses on. And these are the very best cheap glasses you can get from China. So I know they don't block a lot of light out, which helps the illustration. But if you read the text with the glasses on, you can still make the words out. You can still, some of you, if you didn't have to take other glasses off, you can still make the words out. You can still see them. You might have to get a little closer, a little farther away, depending on how special your eyes are. But you can still make the words out, although they're slightly distorted. They're colored, if you will. With the darkness from the glasses, the lenses. I want you to understand the parable of the rich man. It's not a parable about money. It's a parable about lenses. And we approach the scripture, we approach the word of God with lenses. And those lenses can be one of a million different things. They can be political in nature. They can be about the things we value. They can be about the cars we drive. They can be about the things we want in life. Any one of those things. The people in Paul's lecture to Timothy approach the gospel with lenses on about the resurrection. And it colored the gospel for them. What I want to invite you to do literally now, and very much spiritually, is to take those lenses off. And I want you very plainly to see the word of God. I want you to empty yourself of whatever lens you read scripture through. Because there is one. We all have it. I have it. And I read scripture every day to a very high extent. And even I have to stop myself and take that lens off and say, oh, I only read it that way because I wanted it to say that. We all do this. And if we want to honestly hear the word of God when we open the Bible, we have to be willing to do exactly what Jesus instructed that rich man to do. Let go of the things that entangle your heart. Take your lenses off and with an empty and contrite heart, hear the word of God. If you want to really observe the text, you really want to be a student of the word of God, it's not enough you pick it up and read it. You must empty yourself for it. <coughs> So I invite you, as we take a serious look at how to study the Bible, move your lenses, empty yourself before his word, and let it transform. I want to invite you, as we close, take these glasses home. I know they would be high quality stuff from Amazon. But I want you to take these home, set them aside the Bible. So I want them to remind you. Every time you read that word, you need to empty yourself first. Every time you approach that scripture, you need to see these and remember to take off your own lenses. And let the word of God speak to you fully. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.